Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another one of our student loan help clinics. This time we're gonna really take a deep dive into public service loan forgiveness and other important updates. We're gonna get started here in just a minute. I see folks are trickling in. Um, I wanna just do some quick housekeeping. We are turning on our live transcript for those that have their audio off or that require a, a transcript. Um, we also wanna answer as many questions as possible. We have found that uh, submitting your questions in the chat box to our host and panelists is the best way for us to message back and also for us to cherry pick uh, some of the questions that I think are really valuable to everyone else listening, which we will discuss uh, out loud for the audience. So we have a couple hundred people here joining us. Um, I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds and then we'll get started. All right, with that, I'm gonna pass it to uh, Student Debt Crisis Center's Di Director of Outreach, Sabrina Calazans. Uh, Sabrina, take it from here. Thanks, Cody, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to be here and to help answer some of your questions, um, as well as go through some of the opportunities that you have through the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program and the temporary waiver. Um, as the Director of Outreach, as Cody mentioned, um, I've spoken to several borrowers who have been able to take advantage of this waiver and who have received life-changing relief. So I hope that this is something that you all are able to benefit from as well. Um, so today we are joined by um, our partners at Savvy and Young Invincibles. And um, as you mentioned, we are from Student Debt Crisis Center. We work with borrowers across the country. Um, and our goal is to amplify our stories and voices and really make an impact um, in millions of people's lives. And so thank you again uh, for joining us. So for today's clinic, we'll be discussing the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, the temporary PSLF waiver, and other recent policy updates. At the end, we will share an online tool by Savvy to help you understand your repayment options and enroll in PSLF. And again, just as a disclaimer, we are not financial counselors or attorneys. We are advocates and experts who want to help you. Um, and with that, I'm going to be tossing it to my colleague, Natalia Abrams. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, thank you all for joining us on a Thursday night or early afternoon, wherever you're calling from. Um, it, you know, just by showing up, you're taking a very important step to understanding what's going on with your student loan debt. So what I'm going to go through is what's been going on for the past um, few years with COVID-19 relief. Uh, student loan repayment basics and student loan uh, forgiveness programs, specifically, as Cody said, uh, deep dive on public service loan forgiveness. So as many of you know, I, I would hope by now that uh, the majority of student loans, about 38 million loans have been on pause since March 13th, 2020. Uh, this is Suspension count, uh, time counts towards public service loan forgiveness and default rehab. Uh, payments are have been suspended or will be suspended, excuse me, until January 1st of 2023. That's next year. So we still have some more time. Um, the And then borrowers can recertify their income if uh, through an income-driven repayment program if their income changes during the time of COVID. So there are some people that are still making payments as well, especially if you have older loans that weren't included, even though they are federal loans. Um, not to worry, you could still count for the upcoming cancellation, but we know that you have been excluded during this time. So there's also been specific relief for borrowers in default. During this time of COVID, tax and social security withholdings have been <clears throat> suspended. Uh, you should not be having any withholdings due to defaulted student loans. For borrowers in default, employers are instructed to halt wage garnishments. Um, and if you did have your wages garnished, we definitely saw some of this at the beginning of the pandemic, you are entitled to a refund. In addition, collection activities like calls and letters to defaulted borrowers have been paused. You should not have been harassed 
Um, and again, if you have, that's something that you can complain to the student loan ombudsperson. So let's go through some updates uh, because there is a lot going on in this student debt space. Um, and if you're a student loan borrower, you might be feeling a little bit of whiplash with all of the announcements. So we're just going to try to take you know through a few of them. One is that for so many borrowers, you may have noticed that your student loan servicer has changed or you've gotten a notice that your student loan servicer is going, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to change. Um, three federal student loan servicers, Navient, FedLoan, which did pub uh, public service loan forgiveness, so many of you, and Granite State said that they would stop servicing loans. This impacted 16 million student loan borrowers or 35% of borrowers have had to have a servicer change. And importantly for the public service loan forgiveness program, your loans have been transferred to Mojia. Um, many people started to receive notices over the, the summer and that is where you know the transfers are happening now. We are hearing from borrowers about discrepancies with credit. For many that is being worked out in time, but that is something that we're keeping an eye on to make sure the servicers are doing the right thing. The second update is uh, to income driven repayments. There uh, is a one time waiver for this that will be automatic. Um, this is to address forbearance steering. Uh, that for so many of us, when we called and couldn't make our loan payments, we were put into forbearance versus an income driven repayment program that added a lot of unnecessary interest to the loan. So this, there will be a one-time account adjustment. There's nothing you need to know or need to do with this. The good thing is though, if you're looking to consolidate, worried about past time not counting, that will count. Um, this should also account for an immediate debt cancellation for 40,000 borrowers under PSLF and thousands more will receive more credit than they had in the past. And finally, update three, probably one of the biggest updates um, is what's been going on with targeted debt cancellation. This is separate than the large amount that President Biden has just recently canceled. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the Department of Education has discharged $5.8 billion for those who have attended Corinthian colleges. We've also seen um, data matches for those with total and permanent disability received full cancellation as well, and billions of <clears throat> dollars of more for-profit college debt like ICT Tech, Arts Institute, and Westwood College have seen their debt canceled. And in addition, we are, we are also starting to see the beginnings of the rollout of the student debt cancellation plan. For those of you that don't know, uh, a few weeks ago, President Biden announced that he would cancel $10,000 in student debt for all borrowers making under $125,000 a year or $250,000 per household, an additional $10,000, so that's up to $20,000 for anyone that received even as little as a dollar of a Pell Grant, um, when, which was largely given to low-income borrowers at the time they borrowed when they started college. So you could be entitled up to $20,000 in debt relief. Right now, there's not much you can do for debt cancellation. The big thing is you can go um, make sure that your loans are up to date and you can sign up. And I'm sure Cody's sharing a link through um, the Department of Ed to be notified when the form will be out, which is in early to mid-October. Another important date will be November 15th if, uh, to apply in order to receive debt cancellation before payments resume. And finally, what we're gonna talk even more about tonight is the PSLF waiver. This is another one-time um, event. The, there's a limited waiver right now, which is to you know, say simply righting the wrongs of the public service loan forgiveness program. So they will be reviewing denied applications. If you were denied before, please, please, please apply again. 
it's very important to apply by October 31st of this year. Um, and you can have, you know, credits counted that were not previously counted correctly. And even if you're retired and you've worked the 10 years and will go more into the program, you can also see uh, your debt wiped out. This is just a reminder um, that through this process, through talking about all of these changes, we know that there are a lot of um, issues and complaints that come up and bad actors within the loan servicers. We encourage you always, if you need to submit a complaint, do so with the Federal Student Aid Ombudsperson or FSA Ombudsman Office at ed.gov. Um, this is where you, uh, the ombudsperson can help you resolve discrepancies with loan balances and payments, explain loan interest and collection charges, identify options for resolving your issues, um, and you can share those with Bonnie Littrell at the email provided on your screen. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Cody, I believe. Yep. All right, so we got the updates out of the way. That's good news because I know there's so much happening in student debt world. Um, I put in the chat for everyone, you know, we're hosting workshops about many other topics. Uh, so we've got a cancellation focused one uh, next week. But what we're here for today is to really talk about public service loan forgiveness. And this is really urgent for us because as Natalia mentioned, there is a temporary one-time opportunity to qualify for this program with expanded rules under what is called the PSLF waiver. So I'm gonna start by just explaining what public service loan forgiveness is, and then I'm gonna have one of our partners come in here and talk about what these new rules mean for borrowers. So let's uh, go to the next slide and get started. So what is public service loan forgiveness? This is the basics of the plan as it was written into law. So the program started in October of 2007. A borrower must make 120 monthly payments before they can receive relief. And those payments are cumulative, not consecutive. So a borrower can, uh, have, can work in public service, they can go to the private sector, and then they can go back to public service and they can combine all of their time. Uh, also, borrowers can combine time spent working at at multiple jobs. So you can also work multiple public service jobs at the same time to meet your uh, requirements to be fully employed for a public service job. Um, after you've met your 120 monthly payments, whatever remaining debt is there is forgiven tax-free. So that's what the program's broad contours look like. Now to really benefit from public service loan forgiveness, you need to be in an affordable federal repayment plan. Uh, these are what we call income driven repayment plans. Uh, the reason is if you're just in the standard plan, which is what a borrower would automatically be put into after they leave their program, your loan structure is set up for you to pay back your student loans in 10 years anyways. So it doesn't really make sense. What you need to do is enroll in an income-driven repayment plan. This lowers your monthly payment. And that means that when you go to apply for public service loan forgiveness after 10 years, you really maximize the amount of debt that can be forgiven. Next slide, please. So we ask ourselves a few questions and there's a few actions to take to really meet the requirements for PSLF under what I'm gonna call the standard rules. These have been the rules of public service loan forgiveness before the temporary waiver, and these will be the rules after the temporary waiver. So first, are you paying back a federal direct loan? Borrowers that have any type of federal loan that is not a direct loan do not qualify for public service loan forgiveness. So we have a lot of older borrowers that have federal family education loans or Perkins loans. Those do not qualify for public service loan forgiveness. I'm gonna explain momentarily how, uh, in just a few moments, how you can make them qualify, but they do not. Um, second question, does your employer qualify? Uh, public service loan forgiveness is available or could be available to up to one in four workers in America. This includes anyone who works for a government 
at any level. And this includes anyone that works for a 501c3 nonprofit. The third question we ask is, are you enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan? And I've, I've kind of touched on this, but we need to be in certain repayment plans that the government offers to qualify for public service loan forgiveness. Uh, when we've met these requirements, there's just two things we need to do. We need to document our employment using the PSLF form. There's a section called the employer certification form or a verification certification form, I'm sorry, uh, that we go to and we document our qualifying employment there and we prove to the Department of Education that our employers are governments or nonprofits. And after we've met all of our 120 payments, we submit a final application. So here's just a quick summary of uh, what qualifies for PSLF. So we have direct subsidized loans and unsubsidized loans. Keep in mind this says direct. We have direct graduate plus loans. And there should be an asterisk here. Direct parent plus loans do not qualify for PSLF as they are. I'm gonna explain in a moment how they can become eligible. Uh, and we should have direct consolidated loans as well, those to qualify. Uh, we need to be in the right repayment plan. So the 10 year standard repayment, repayment plan qualifies. Keep in mind, as I said, it doesn't really make sense to be in that plan because you'll likely pay off your loans. We wanna be in these income driven repayment plans that are listed there. Uh, and one more reminder, all levels of government, 501c3 nonprofits and other critical public service jobs qualify for PSLF. And I'm just listing a few examples here because I, I know it from experience that folks are really not sure what we mean by uh, working in a nonprofit or working in government. So when we say a 501c3 nonprofit, we're talking often about charity charities. These can also include nonprofit healthcare facilities, nonprofit schools, legal aid services, so many more. I mean, there are so many nonprofit services in our communities helping people get housing, get food, you name it. And on the government side, I always want to tell folks, it does mat not matter what your job is in government. You could be a firefighter, a nurse, a teacher. You could also work as the janitorial staff at City Hall. All that matters is who is your employer? That's the big thing here. So under the standard rules, we have a list of things that typically would not qualify. So like I mentioned, older FFEL loans do not qualify, Perkins loans do not qualify, and direct Parent PLUS loans, really Parent PLUS loans of any kind, do not qualify. But you can consolidate into a new direct consolidation loan to become eligible. So that's the little asterisk there. Also, loans in default do not qualify. So those that are behind on payments and are in default, um, you don't qualify unless you get your loan back into good standing. Uh, on the repayment plan column, there are other repayment options that the federal government offers that do not qualify. Extended repayment, graduated repayment, the combination of the two, and time spent in deferment and forbearance. And on the employer side, I wanna clarify something about the government workers. There are folks that work at governments as contractors whose employees, employers are actually private businesses. Government contractors in those situations do not count. Labor unions do not count. But that does not mean that if you are a worker as like a nurse or a teacher who happens to be unionized, that you do not qualify. This is just the people who literally work for an, a, a labor union as you know, administrative staff or whatever it may be. 501c4 nonprofits, political groups uh, do not qualify. And last, time spent in religious instruction does not count. So you can work for faith-based organizations doing other types of work, but religious instruction does not count. Okay, I'm gonna pass it off to Lindsay here. She's gonna explain why these issues created problems and why we have this new fix that's designed, at least temporarily, to create some solutions here. So Lindsay, take it away from here. Great, thanks Cody. Uh, and it's great to be with everyone tonight. 
So uh, the Peace Love Program started October 1 of 2007, meaning the earliest wave of borrowers that would be eligible to potentially start receiving full forgiveness on the remainder of that loan balance was October 2017. Uh, and over 100,000 borrowers applied. Uh, and unfortunately, less than 1% were accepted. And pretty much up until I would say last September of, of last year, 2021, so you know from 2017 until through 2021, only about 16,000 borrowers total had achieved uh, forgiveness under this program, which was basically still under 1% acceptance rate. Why was this the case? Well, it was these technicalities around the eligibility requirements uh, that Cody had just sort of walked you through. Things like needing to have the right loan type, a direct loan. This was something that borrowers were either unaware of or once they did become aware, unfortunately, um, based on the rules of the program uh, under the original format, once they did consolidate to a direct loan, they basically had to start back at zero and were told they needed to work another 10 years and make another 120 payments. So to say that that was frustrating to hear after uh, thinking that they were going to have their loans forgiven uh, from working in public service for a decade uh, is uh, an understatement, um, uh, if there ever was one. Uh, aside from just loan type, repayment plan. So many borrowers were not on the right repayment plan and had no idea uh, that by being on that plan, those payments were not counting as qualifying payments towards the 120 needed to achieve full forgiveness. So these technicalities, all right, um, that ultimately uh, sort of detracted from the promise of the program uh, being sort of, uh, you know, uh, committed to, uh, these technicalities kept borrowers uh, from achieving success under PSLF. So after years of uh, sort of lo lots of hard work from advocates and, you know, huge shout out to uh, the advocates at Young Invincibles and especially, um, you know, our friends at, at Student Debt Crisis Center, uh, Sabrina, Natalia, and Cody um, have been working very, very hard on, on all your behalves for years uh, and trying to push to reform this program. And uh, luckily, and fortunately, as of October of last year, 2021, the Department of Education finally came out with a huge announcement and basically a temporary overhaul to this program uh, in an attempt to rectify some of those wrongs. So I'm gonna sort of outline those here uh, so you can sort of see how this might impact uh, you as a borrower and your eligibility. So they, are, they introduced this overhaul uh, as a what they're calling a temporary PSLF limited waiver, okay? Now, this idea of a limited waiver does not refer to a physical thing or an application. So there's no special waiver application or anything like that. It more so refers to a period of time between last October, 2021, when this was announced, to this coming October 31st, 2022, that is the deadline of this waiver. All right, so this period of time during which borrowers can take action by submitting PSLF employment certification forms, to retroactively receive credit for payments made that previously would have been deemed ineligible. So this is how they've expanded that eligibility uh, as follows. So I'm gonna sort of do it along the same three categories of loan type, repayment plan, and employer. So when it comes to loan types, now, uh, if you had a FELL loan and you were making payments on that loan uh, while working for a qualifying employer, uh, you still need to consolidate that loan into a direct loan However, now you are able to get credit for those payments before that consolidation. All right, so previously, before this waiver went into effect, those borrowers were told basically you had to start over at zero and work another 10 years and 120 payments. Now you're able to get credit for those past payments. Same goes for Perkins loans as well. When it comes to repayment plans, all right, again, originally under the, uh, the, the original rules of the program, only payments made under income-driven repayment plans uh, were eligible. Now they are giving uh, credit and counting any payment made on any type of repayment plan. Doesn't matter which one. Okay. Uh, and so again, repayment on loans that happened prior to that consolidation, normally consolidation, right, would reset that credit count back at zero. Now you're able to receive credit uh, for payments made prior to that consolidation. They're also giving credit for payments that weren't necessarily made for the on time and full monthly amount. So if you were a little bit late with that payment or it wasn't for the full uh, monthly amount due, they're being pretty lenient and giving credit uh, regardless. 
And then last but not least, when it comes to employers, this one hasn't changed too much. All right, you still need to be employed by any government organization at any level, federal, state, local, or tribal, or any non-for-profit 501c3. However, one of the stipulations they have included in this waiver is that you no longer need to be employed uh, by a qualifying employer at the time you were actually applying to receive forgiveness. So what this means is uh, borrowers who, let's say, retired a couple of years ago uh, and maybe had applied for the program but were rejected for one of those technicalities, but had made 120 payments, now under this waiver, because of the uh, changes in the eligibility requirements, they can now apply, uh, even though they're no longer working for a qualifying employer, they can now apply and receive full forgiveness on their loan balance. So it's potentially life-changing for many people who had thought uh, that they were going to be stuck with that debt uh, you know, for the rest of their retirement. Also, periods of service uh, that were previously used for teacher loan forgiveness are now able to count towards public service loan forgiveness. So uh, normally, uh, under the original rules of the program, uh, let's say you uh, were eligible for teacher loan forgiveness and received that money, uh, you would basically start back over at zero. Now you can use that period of time, those five years that you put towards teacher loan forgiveness, that can also count towards public service loan forgiveness. Uh, so again, what this has really amounted to is the, an expansion of the eligibility requirements for this limited period of time. So it means that uh, you know, from this past October to this coming October 31st, anyone who wishes to have their situation reviewed under these new rules uh, and to maximize their benefit, right, um, and get payments counted towards those 120 that normally wouldn't, needs to take one action and one action only, and that is to submit their PSLF employment certification forms. So I'm going to walk you through a few different scenarios uh, right now that are basically going to help you sort of decide what to do next, all right, uh, based on some uh, different classifications and characteristics around your situation. So let's start out with the first and most important one, all right. Let's say you don't know what kind of loans you have, okay. You can find out what type of loan you have by logging into your federal student aid account at studentaid.gov, visiting the My Aid page and scrolling down to the loan breakdown section. All right, there you will find a list of each federal loan you've borrowed, even if you've paid the loan off or consolidated uh, at any point into a new loan. Now, from there, it's pretty easy um, and intuitive to determine what kind of loan you have. So direct loans will literally begin with the word direct. FEL loans or FFEL, Federal Family Education Loans, will start with FFEL. And Perkins loans, again, will include the name Perkins in uh, the, the name of the, the loan type. All right, so from there, you're gonna sort of say, okay, what type of loans do I have? Now, if you have at least one federal loan that is not a direct loan, meaning it's a FELL loan, it's a Perkins loan, uh, it's a Parent PLUS loan, you will need to submit a consolidation application, okay? And you can do that also through uh, that studentaid.gov uh, FSA account. You will need to submit that form uh, by October 31st, the waiver deadline, in order to benefit from this waiver, okay? Uh, the Department of Ed encourage, encourages you to consolidate before using any of their PSLF help tools or anything like that. Uh, so again, I would encourage you, you can, you can complete that application. There's an online portal, it takes about 10 minutes to go through, and you're able to consolidate that loan to make it eligible. Uh, again, under this waiver, you're able to get credit for the payments made before the consolidation, but you still need to consolidate if you have a loan that is not a direct loan. Okay, moving on to the next scenario. Let's say you have uh, direct loans, okay, uh, and you've already certified some employment. So you've checked your loans, you've got direct loans, great, they're already eligible, you don't need to consolidate, and you've already submitted at some point in time uh, a PSLF employment certification form. Uh, and it's been reviewed, and they have awarded you qualifying payment credits. All right, so if, that, if this is you, if you've already done this, uh, basically, the Department of Education has indicated that they will update your credit count, okay, and award you any additional uh, qualifying payments that you deserve automatically, all right? All right, so they are able to do this because they are already reviewing and have already received your employment certification forms. So federal student aid may contact you and ask you to certify any additional periods of employment that they are not able to, um, they're not able to verify. So you're definitely going to want to look out for an email from federal student aid, uh, and again, they will let you know how many additional payments they have determined that you might qualify for. 
Uh, but otherwise, you don't really need to do anything uh, until you receive that updated payment count. Now, if you haven't received an updated payment count and believe you should have, uh, I you know, would highly suggest uh, that it, you either resubmit those employment certification forms or again, reach out to possibly the ombudsman uh, to escalate your case and make sure uh, that it is being reviewed properly. Okay, another scenario, let's say you have direct loans, great, okay, no need to, to consolidate and have not applied for PSLF ever, okay? So what you're gonna wanna do is submit a PSLF form or what's called the employment certification form. It's the one form and one form only for the program. All right, to Mohila Servicing, M-O-H-E-L-A, so that the Department of Education can review your loans under these new rules and determine whether uh, you basically qualify. So uh, you can see if your employer is eligible at the PSLF help tool uh, at studentaid.gov slash PSLF. However, when it comes to submitting these forms, uh, you must do so either via mail, uh, snail mail, or fax. Okay, those are the only ways in which to submit these to Mohila if you don't have a Mohila account. If you already have a Mohila account, you can upload those forms directly into your account portal, all right? Now I would say this, this is sort of a hurry up and wait situation. Because of the, the surge in volume as a result of this waiver announcement, um, they've received more applications in the last six months than they have ever for the entire program. Uh, and therefore there are tremendous delays in processing, all right? So that's something to be aware of. Uh, because you could submit an application now, but it might be anywhere between six to eight to 12 weeks before you actually hear uh, any definitive results, all right? But that's that's not sort of for you to, to worry about. The most important thing for you to worry about is submitting those forms before October 31st. As long as you do that, you'll be fine, okay? You'll, you'll get reviewed, et cetera, no matter how long it takes. Uh, you know, that's all you need to do to ensure that you're going to be able to benefit from the waiver, all right? Okay, last scenario here. What if you tried to certify employment? So you tried to submit a PSLF employment certification form, but you were rejected, okay? So if the Department of Education previously said your employer was not eligible for PSLF, we highly suggest you submit a new form to see if you can now receive credit towards forgiveness. A lot of that, that eligibility has changed. Uh, they've updated their systems. And so it's worthwhile to resubmit. Again. Excuse me, you can find out which employers the Department of Education has already deemed eligible through their PSLF help tool. Now, again, mo you know, most of these updates don't affect qualifying employer rules, right? You still, still need to work for a nonprofit 501c3 or a government organization at any level. Um, but again, if you were previously denied for PSLF for this reason or any other reason, you are the exact demographic that should be resubmitting uh, an application now, okay? Uh, because the rules have changed and you need to resubmit that before October 31st if you want to benefit. Okay, last thing that I'm going to talk about here is consolidation, because I know that this can be a tricky topic. Uh, and for the past couple of years, you know, we, when we've been doing workshops, Cody, Natalia, and I, uh, we've always sort of warned borrowers uh, against the risks of consolidating. Because in many instances, you need to consolidate your loan, right, in order for it to become eligible. But many times, borrowers would consolidate their loans when they didn't need to. And regardless of whether they needed to or not, when you consolidated, it reset your credit count. So we warn borrowers to be very careful uh, and really have a conversation before consolidating. So uh, we almost did too good of a job uh, because now under this waiver, it is critical that borrowers who need to consolidate should be consolidating. Uh, but many people are still uh, a little sort of, um, uh, you know, anxious about doing that and understandably. So we wanted to take a second to review exactly why you would need to, to consolidate, what loan types, right, need to be, uh, and then uh, sort of review those reasons why and how you can do it. So just to be clear for everyone out there, these are the loan types that need to be consolidated in order to become eligible for public service loan forgiveness. Parent plus loans, okay, and FELL loans. Now, under the PSLF limited waiver, you must consolidate before that deadline of October 31st. So if you have one of those two loan types, you need to not only consolidate those loans, but you also need to submit the PSLF employment certification forms. You need to do both things. 
right? I also forgot to mention uh, of those loan types that need to be consolidated to become eligible are Perkins loans as well, all right? Now, when it comes to uh, consolidating these, unfortunately, Parent PLUS loans were not included in the PSLF limited waiver. What that means is that when you consolidate your Parent PLUS loans, all right, unfortunately, you're not able to get credit for payments made prior to that consolidation. When you consolidate those Parent PLUS loans, they become eligible, but you basically have to start at zero, okay? However, with those FELL loans, all right, as we have discussed several times now, you still need to consolidate again, but now under this waiver, you are able to get credit for payments made prior to the consolidation. All right. Now, I know that this is a lot <laughs> uh, and it's overwhelming. I, I see some people in the chat saying so, and, and it's a lot to consume in one, in one sitting, uh, but that's exactly why in a second here, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Job, uh, because we have a, an absolutely free, no cost tool and service that we provide to uh, this community of borrowers uh, that can basically help you navigate each step of this process and ensure that you are actually uh, submitting these applications successfully and achieving the best outcome possible. All right, last thing that I'm gonna talk about is why you would need to consolidate because there are a couple different reasons why. Number one is to make your loan type eligible for federal programs, whether that's uh, income-driven repayment or public service loan forgiveness, right? Another reason why you would need to consolidate is to get out of default. Consolidation is sort of a get out of jail free card for default. It basically can bring a defaulted loan automatically into good standing, okay? But it can only be used once to do that, all right? Another reason to consolidate uh, is to uh, include retroactive Parent PLUS loans uh, with other loan types. So let's say you have Parent PLUS loans, but you also have other loans maybe taken out for yourself as the borrower. If you consolidate them all together, those parent plus loans, instead of starting back at zero, will take the loan characteristics of the other loan types. And therefore you can benefit uh, through that and not have to start back at zero when it comes to programs like public service loan forgiveness. Again, the same thing goes for consolidating undergrad and graduate loans together. Loans from different periods of time, all right? When consolidated together, will take the characteristics of the older loans. So on your undergrad loans, you have, let's say, 115 PSLEP credits. But on your grad loans, you haven't been paying them back for that long, you only have 10 credits. If you consolidate them together, all of your loans now have 115 credits and therefore will be forgiven faster all of that debt. Another reason to consolidate is to retroactively claim credits for forgiveness under this waiver. Okay, again, if you've got a loan type that requires consolidation to be eligible, you need to do this in order to benefit from the limited waiver uh, expansion eligibility. And last but not least, why to consolidate? To trigger that PSLF limited waiver account review. Uh, but again, that consolidation needs to come with the PSLF employment certification form, all right, for any current or previous employment that you might have had. Okay, so certifying that you know complete employment history, which could mean multiple forms if you've had multiple previous employers, is critical. But again, for anyone that needs to consolidate based on that loan type. They will need to do that as well before October 31st. All right, uh, I am going to uh, pause here uh, and, um, oh, actually we have one more slide, sorry about that. <laughs> Last thing that I just wanted to say about public service loan forgiveness uh, was some of the benefits that borrowers are seeing uh, as a result of the pandemic relief that went into effect in March of 2020. So as, as all of you are hopefully aware, the payment pause, which began March of 2020 when the CARES Act went into effect, which paused payments and interest uh, on the majority of federal student loans out there uh, and has since been extended seven times, most recently extended through December 31st, uh, that should be of uh, this year, 2022. Uh, so meaning payments will resume in January. But that payment pause from March of 2020 through December 31st of 2022, that's 34 months, all right, in which Payments were paused. You did not need to make a student loan payment. Now, if you've been working for a qualifying employer during that time, for every one of those months, the payments have been paused, 34 in total, you are eligible to receive 34 PSLF uh, credits towards the 120 needed total to achieve full forgiveness on your loan balance. That's a significant way closer uh, towards full forgiveness without having to have made a payment at all. And this is important because I find many borrowers are actually either misinformed or confused about this uh, and actually opted to voluntarily continue making payments 
during the payment pause because they thought they either needed to in order to receive a qualifying payment credit under the program, or they thought they weren't eligible for PSLF uh, and were attempting to try to pay off their loan while there was no interest. If that's the case, if that's you, you are actually eligible to have any payments made during the payment pause voluntarily, okay, uh, uh, refunded to you, all right? If now you're finding out under this waiver that, wow, I'm gonna be a lot closer to forgiveness, I didn't need to pay off uh, or pay anything towards my loans during the payment pause, you can request that uh, to be refunded. Just last week, we had a borrower receive $18,000 uh, refund and then get her loans forgiven about two weeks later uh, because she had you know, voluntarily been making payments thinking she wasn't eligible, found out she was, uh, and was actually at the 120. Uh, and so that was an amazing combination. So we're gonna show you in a second here uh, how the savvy tool, again, a, a no cost, absolutely free tool can help you to not only navigate this process, but take on that administrative burden for you uh, and help you uh, ultimately reach the finish line around what is a very, very complicated uh, program. Despite the waiver, uh, which has been great in, in opening up the eligibility, it, do, it hasn't taken away from the administrative burdens uh, of applying. So that's exactly what we're gonna show you here now. So I will uh, turn it over to my colleague, Job, who will explain what's involved with the tool. Thank you, Lindsay. So I've seen lots of questions that everyone's asking, you know, how do I know what I'm eligible for? It's overwhelming. I, I don't know where to start. And that is exactly what Savvy is for. So talking about Savvy, we're going to cover exactly what we are, how we can help you. And then at the end, we'll do a brief overview of what our website looks like so that you can understand how you need to enter your information and get started seeing repayment and forgiveness options. So really quick, what is Savvy? We're a public benefit corporation. We combine technology, human expertise, and advanced borrower support. So we were founded and run by student loan experts who have that knowledge to help you find the best options for you. All right, so let's go into what Savvy can do. You can check your eligibility and qualifications for income-driven repayment plans, public service loan forgiveness, teacher loan forgiveness, and more. Once you enter in your information, we will automatically compare that with the eligibility requirements for all these programs. That way you don't have to figure out what you're eligible for on your own. Once we figure out what you qualify for, you'll be able to see personalized repayment and forgiveness options that are tailored specifically to you to show you what monthly payments you're eligible for, how much you can get forgiven and make it as simple as possible. We have digital applications to help you enroll in these programs. That way you're not having to print out forms, track people down to get signatures or fax or mail anything. We will take care of all of that for you digitally to make it as quick and easy as possible. We also help you monitor each of these applications. And we also monitor for new policy changes and announcements. As Lindsay has said, and you've seen, there's been so many recent changes with the waiver, with cancellation. Savvy monitors all that for you. That way we can automatically check for what you apply for or qualify for. And the biggest thing is that you can get one-on-one -on -one support with student loan experts to answer your questions, help you see what you qualify for, and make sure that you are on track. As Lindsay has said, this is completely free, no cost to you. So we'll provide the link for you to sign up and get started so you can see your options for free. So getting started, here's that link. We'll be sure to drop that in the chat. Be sure to go through that link. That way you can access Savvy for free to see what you are eligible for. So once you get to our website, this is kind of what our main page is. And on the next slide, we'll be able to see what it looks like once you've got an account. So this is your main dashboard. This is where you'll be able to track the progress of everything you're working on with Savvy, whether it is that employment certification form to apply for forgiveness or an IDR application to enroll in an income-driven repayment plan. So once you get into the application, you'll start entering in your personal information. That way we can determine what you're eligible for. You enter things like family and income so that we can determine your income driven or payment plan options. And you'll also be able to add in your employment so that we can check for public service loan forgiveness. It's very important that you're adding in all of your current and past employment on this page, because as we've said, you have to submit an employment certification form for each of your employers to get credit. And we can only create that form for the people you've added on this page. So be sure you're adding in all of your employers, that way nobody gets missed and you're getting credit for as many payments as possible. Another step is to sync your loans. Whenever you do this, it simply takes a snapshot of the loans that you currently have 
so that we can see your balance, see your payment history, and figure out what's going on. Savvy is not a loan servicer. We're just a free benefit that is offered to you. So this doesn't move your loans to us or anything. It's just so that we can see what's going on and help figure out these estimates for you. You have a few options for doing this. The easiest way to do it is to simply sync through Plaid, which connects your online servicer's account to Savvy and will pull in all of your loans automatically. You can also add them in manually. So there's lots of options to get those in there. Now, this is what the results page will look like, which is what everybody wants to know. What am I eligible for? So on this page, it will show you that detailed breakdown to show you exactly what you qualify for. In this picture, you can see once you've entered in all your information, we'll show you a plan you're eligible for with what your payment will be, how much you'll pay, when you'll be eligible for forgiveness, and how much you can get. We'll show you every plan that you're eligible for so you can click show more plans to see every single option that's available to you to know exactly what paths you have to move forward. Now, this is what these applications will look like whenever we digitize them for you. On the left, you can see those employment certification forms that are needed to apply for forgiveness. So once you've added in each of your employers, you can click start ECF and create that employment certification form for each of your past employers. You'll enter in contact information if we don't have it already, and then Savvy will take it from there. We'll send that digital form over to your employers, track them down and get it signed for you. And once they sign, submit it straight to the servicers to get it processed as soon as possible. On the right, you can see what an income-driven repayment application looks like. A benefit of using Savvy is that we check what plans are eligible for, and then we'll pre-fill the application for you. You just got to enter that last little bit of personal information, click submit, and we'll get it to your servicer to enroll you in your plan and start getting you those savings. This is back to the dashboard. So that once you start working with us, you can see exactly what you're working on. So after you've started those employment certifications or an income-driven or payment plan, you can see where you're at in the process and know what you still need to get completed to meet that October 31st deadline. So in this picture, you can see the progress of each of your employment certification forms, knowing whether your employer has signed, whether it's been signed and submitted, or if it's already been processed and the results have gotten there. And then that last bit, you can see the progress of your income driven or payment application. And it also breaks it down to show you exactly what steps we need from you to get those applications to 100%. The biggest benefit of Savvy is that you have access to the student loan experts to give you that one-on-one -on -one support. So as you're working through, you'll be able to consult our help center, which has tons of frequently asked questions, common topics with student loans that you can read through and get answers. And you'll also be able to reach out to our support team who can answer your questions, help clarify eligibility for programs, clarify things about how the Savvy website works and get that one-on-one -on -one support to breach forgiveness as soon as possible. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Cody now to talk about some of the upcoming things and start our wrap up. Awesome. Thank you so much, Job. Um, I know there's a ton of questions. Some of them are about public service loan forgiveness, but there's also some about broad student debt cancellation that the president announced. Before we get into our Q&A section, I'm going to drop in the chat here an upcoming webinar that SDCC is hosting next week that will focus just on the president's broad student debt announcement. So I'm gonna drop it into the chat. Anyone that wants to RSVP, you can do so. It will be hosted on Zoom. So you can join by computer or telephone, just like you are now. And as one more reminder, all of these links that we're sharing, these resources and um, a recording to this workshop will be shared uh, tomorrow through an automated email that goes to folks that registered for today's event. So keep an eye out for that as well. So with that, let's jump into Q&A. We've got a ton of great questions and a lot of these I think are gonna help tons of people that are listening. I've been pulling some that I think are really valuable. So I'm gonna just go in order here from when I received them. Uh, the first question came from an anonymous borrower that joined us and they wanted to know why they cannot count uh, employment at public service in a public service job before 2007. So can we just explain one more time what that what the timelines are here for public service loan forgiveness? Sure, Cody. So um, the pro the reason why is because the PSLF program did not start or was not sort of implemented and, and uh, did not become law until October 1, 2007. And so therefore, uh, 
basically the eligible time frame for any employment uh, or payments to count towards qualifying uh, as qualifying credits and, and towards that 120 is October 1, 2007. So unfortunately, you know, if you've been in public service since 1995, uh, you know, till, till present, everything from 1995 up until October 1, 2007 is pretty much irrelevant for the purposes of this program. Uh, the only sort of eligible time frame is October 1, 2007 to present day. Uh, so that's again why 2017 was sort of the first year that the first wave of borrowers became eligible uh, to reach that 120 and receive forgiveness. So that's just sort of how the program was set up and the rules of the program uh, and uh, the way it works. Thanks and Lindsay, while I've got you on, I've got a question that keeps coming up that when we host these workshops, I think I always send your way because you have the best answer on this. What should a borrower do if they want to apply for PSLF and they can't contact a former employer because maybe they're closed or perhaps they're just not responding anymore? What options are available to a borrower? Yeah, so actually, um, if and this happens all the time, so it's, it's sort of more common than you might think, but uh, if you're not able to acquire uh, an authorized signature on that employment certification, form for one reason or another, as Cody mentioned, maybe the organization no longer exists, uh, et cetera. Um, you are able to submit a request through that PSLF help tool to have your uh, form reviewed uh, and certified by the Department of Ed based on IRS data. So they will actually go back and look uh, and verify your W-2 uh, and verify that you uh, were an employee there and then verify the employer status at that period of time. Uh, so that also goes for what, you know, they might not have been closed, but perhaps they uh, became a private entity or were not always the same type of status, et cetera. So again, they can review what the IRS status was during that period of time. Uh, and so the best way to do that is to submit that request through the PSLF help tool. There were a lot of questions from folks too, who wanted to know, should they apply for PSLF now before the waiver ends? even if they haven't already completed 120 qualifying payments? Yes, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't answer fast enough, but absolutely. So, and this is a common sort of misconception and, and it's understandable, but under this waiver, it's not that you need to reach 120 qualifying payments by October 31st. In fact, most people will have not reached 120 qualifying payments. How, the only thing that you need to do uh, during this waiver is to make sure that you've submitted employment certification forms for, like I said, any current or previous employment you might have had so that you can receive retroactive credit for any payments uh, that will now count under this waiver. So for some, you know, uh, very fortunate, uh, you know, uh, population of borrowers, what that has meant is that it's brought them right to 120 or over. And so therefore they've become eligible for immediate and full forgiveness. But for the majority of other borrowers, it's meant that it's gonna bring them a heck of a lot closer towards that 120. So not necessarily there yet, but much closer because now they're able to get more payments counted uh, as qualifying payment credits. So uh, my best advice for anyone here who is sort of trying to figure out their eligibility, don't self-select <laughs> if in doubt, submit the forms. It's in your best interest to do so. You have absolutely nothing to lose. Uh, and what keeps us up at night is someone either thinking they're not eligible and not submitting anything and not taking that action or step and missing out on potentially full forgiveness either now or uh, in the next year or so um, because they did not take this action. So it is sort of a once in a lifetime opportunity. The rules go back to the original format after October 31st. Uh, and you will no longer be able to receive that benefit. So it is very much worth it to submit um, regardless of how, uh, where you are, whether you, you're one month in or whether you're uh, you know, 15 years in, you're gonna wanna submit this. Great, I'm gonna address a question I saw come up a few times and it's a pretty simple one, but it's really important. A couple of folks wanted to know, does military service qualify for PSLF? And the answer is absolutely yes. I mean. I can't think of a more uh, exemplary case for the purpose of public service loan forgiveness than to help folks like our service members and veterans receive relief. And you do qualify. And the one thing I wanted to also add is that the Department of Education has actually gone further and they're taking two additional steps to help veterans. So uh, the first set is the department's gonna try to use 
federal data to automatic to match federal uh, employees that are service members or veterans to give credit towards PSLF automatically. So they're going to try to streamline the process for these veterans and service members. Uh, second, the department is going to credit some service members for periods of military deferment and forbearance to count towards public service loan forgiveness. So uh, that's a really important point. I see uh, another question that just popped up in the chat from Ken. Uh, Ken, that still only that still only applies to military service after uh, October of 2007. So that window has not changed at all, even with these new temporary rules. Okay, uh, some other questions here. Um, I saw a lot of folks ask about uh, part-time employment. So can a borrower work less than 30 hours and qualify for PSLF? And in some instances, what if they work multiple qualifying jobs that add up to 30 or more hours per week? Does that count? Yeah, Cody, I'm happy to answer this one. So uh, yes, if you, um, you do not need to, to work for just one qualifying employer full-time or 30 hours or more in order to qualify, you can combine part-time employment uh, so long as each and all of the uh, employers are qualifying entities. And so long as you are combined working 30 hours or more a week, you can qualify. So uh, you can use that again, but just so long as the employers are all qualifying and uh, the 30 hours or more combined uh, is met. So if you work for a nonprofit hospital part-time and let's say Starbucks part-time, um, that Starbucks is not an eligible employer, right? So you need all the employers to be eligible uh, and 30 hours or more a week. And then if you're submitting a PSLF application and you have more than one employer that qualifies, how do you, what do you do with the paperwork? Because I know on the form, it's a bit limited on one sheet. So what is the process there? Sure. So, I mean, if you have more than, than one employer, you would indicate uh, you're asked full-time and part-time, you'd indicate part-time and uh, you'd indicate how many hours uh, you work uh, on average uh, for that employer. And then if you have another employer during that same period of time, you will need a separate uh, employment certification form or second sheet basically where the employer signs off. Um, and that you know, second employer or however many employers you've had during a certain period all need to be certified separately. So that means that each one needs their own PSLF employment certification form, all right? Um, so you know, that's, and it needs to get signed off by that respective employer. Uh, so, you know, people, we've had borrowers submit upwards of 10 plus of these forms. Again, if, if you have multiple employers during the same period of time, or you've got multiple previous employment, um, you know, not overlapping, each employer requires its own separate employment certification form. I saw this question come up more than once, and I, I think I'm going to just take a moment to highlight this because it's really important. Uh, borrowers always ask us, do parent plus loans qualify for public service loan forgiveness? And I, I started to talk about it in my section and I just wanna make sure it's clear. A parent plus loan at face, in its original form as a parent plus loan does not technically qualify for public service loan forgiveness. And that can include an FFEL parent plus loan and it can include even a direct parent plus loan. But what a parent can do who has a plus loan is they can consolidate their loans and doing so creates a brand new direct consolidation loan that does qualify. And this is, this is across the board for, uh, for all of these programs, including public service loan forgiveness, the waiver rules, and even folks who want to qualify for um, other programs that exist, including um, uh, the president's cancellation action. So if you have a loan that does not qualify for a program, you can consolidate to then be eligible for that program. So that's something I really want to um, I really want to highlight because I think it's important here. We definitely hear from a lot of parents and, and older borrowers as well. Um, Lindsay, this came up from a couple of folks, including R. Uh, they wanted to know when it comes to consolidating to apply for PSLF under the waiver, what is the kind of order of operation? Do they consolidate first, then apply? Can they do them at the same time? Should they wait, you know, the six to 12 weeks to hear back or, or whatever, it, how long it will take to hear back for their consolidation? 
what is your the process here? Yeah, that's a great question. So you should uh, do both as soon as possible, and you can do them simultaneously. So, for example, you know, if right after this webinar, you know, you realize I need to consolidate and I need to submit employment certification forms. You can go and submit that consolidation application online tonight. Uh, that application usually takes uh, 30 days to process for that to be completed and your loans to be consolidated with Mohila, that's the, the PSLF servicer. So for that, sort of, that process to be sort of finalized. Um, and so that, again, you can initiate and complete in about 10 minutes and you should do right away. Uh, and then at the sort of same time, uh, you should initiate the, your process around getting your employment certification signed, especially if you've got multiple employers uh, that you need to track down and get uh, that signature. Uh, and so, um, uh, those both are submitted and, and processed through Mohila and under this waiver, they can be submitted simultaneously. So, you know, let's say you submit a form to Mohila, a uh, PSLF form to Mohila, uh, and you haven't consolidated yet, that's okay, but you're going to need to consolidate before the waiver deadline. Again, you need to do both before the waiver deadline in order to become eligible to benefit from the waiver. Great. Uh, I see we're at time. So we're going to wrap up here and I'm going to make sure that folks uh, get these resources, links and the link to the video uh, in an email tomorrow. In the meantime, um, thank you all for joining us. We know there's a ton of updates and news and all sorts of information uh, coming our way in the student loan world. We're going to keep hosting these type of events. So stay tuned. We have heard from others that that they prefer to join a few of these because every time they join the next one, they learn more. So keep an eye out from our team. We'll be uh, sending out more invitations for future events. Thank you all for joining us this evening and we'll see you soon.